I'm just sitting here in front of my book uh, bookcase for a reason because I want to tell you about this book Noel bought me for Christmas Anamkara Wisdom Spiritual Wisdom from the Celtic World by John O'Donoghue some of you may know of John O'Donoghue he was a Catholic priest and a philosopher poet really talked a lot about nature and feeling connected when you're in nature he spoke about places having like an energy a soul so when you go out to go somewhere you leave your house and in the modern world we tend to think that you know you're just going from one building to another building and you discard this space in between it's just something that you have to get through to get somewhere else but he said when we step out into nature we're stepping into a living place there is this um, aliveness to the landscape and that it actually holds memory I'm interested in this because I kind of had an experience of it last summer when we stayed at the house as you know we camped there now this wasn't for any particular reason to you know spiritual reason to feel that we wanted to connect with the land and get to know it and be in relationship with it although I have to say that the very first time we arrived there both Noel and I felt something we felt it, it, it it's it was tangible almost certainly when we were there in the summer we got used to uh, to just having to live on the land because we didn't have water as you know we were collecting water and we were roughing it but we, we loved every minute of it we absolutely loved it but there's one time in particular that I really felt a kind of connection and it was when we lost Roy so if you haven't seen that video already I'll link it up here but if you keep watching there is a bit of a you know it's a bit of a spoiler because you probably know that Roy's okay and he was in the last video and so uh, it's more a case of seeing that we were making that footage we were filming in real time when we didn't know what the outcome would be and we, we were really anxious because we, we didn't know if he was alive, if he got run over. I can remember at the evening, the first night we didn't have him with us, I remember walking over to the house alone, going into the house and I went to the final room uh, on the left, it was the one that looked out onto the back of the house, you know, the forest in the distance. And I can remember just, just asking, you know, please, please help. I, I wasn't even praying, I, it, this wasn't religious, but there was a sense of just looking out there and thinking somewhere, if he's somewhere out there, please bring him home. And I had this sense of um, everything would be all right, you know? It wasn't that I heard a voice, it wasn't talking to ancestors or ghosts or anything like that, but it was just intuitive. And it was like, everything's gonna be all right. And even by the end of the next day, he would be back with us. There was just that, a knowingness is all I can say. And I felt hopeful, I felt lifted. I thought, I just, I might be imagining all this, but if I am imagining it, it's made me feel, okay and I can settle for the night and of course you'll know the outcome that you know we did get him back the next day um, but that was my first experience of feeling a kind of energy of the place because it wasn't just the house I've, I've heard people talking about places having like a guardian energy a guardian spirit and maybe that's that's my first experience of feeling that it was kind of looking after us and and this is why it influences how we feel about choices we make about moving forward with the build because it is as though we've made this agreement this pact this contract with the house the land that you know if if we look after you you look after us and it did that with the road you know the the the, the field opened up a big seam of rock that we could use to rebuild the road and if we had, a, had to buy and bring in 
all the uh, hardcore and everything we needed for every level of the building of that road, it would have bankrupted us. You know, we would have spent our whole budget, no question about it. In the end, it was a fraction of the cost just because we had to get some like um, limestone for the top layer. But other than that, everything was done from the, you know, the land helping out, meeting us where we were at and just problem solving together and working together. So we thought that we really needed to name the house. And if it had had a, a name already, you know, we would have used that name if it, um, but the people who lived there before, the family, it never named it. They must have just, it must have just been known as their farm, you know, the so-and-so family's farm. And so, yeah, we, we needed to give it a name because I think when you name something, you're acknowledging that you're in a relationship with it and that you have this, you, you just care about it a bit more. You don't just see it as material stuff to use. You, you, you recognize that it has a soul, if that makes sense. I know this might get, be getting a bit weird for some of you, but it's relevant because of what I'm gonna be telling you next. So what to name the house? We really needed help with it because if we tried to name it ourselves, it would be quite obvious that it was an, you know, English people trying to choose Irish names and putting them together and it not working very well, you know. We really needed an Irish person to name it for us. We thought, well, who shall we ask? We don't know anyone. And then I remembered that I did actually know someone who would be the perfect person to name it because he was a priest and he lived in County Cork, but was born and brought up in County Cork, now lives in California. I know him through YouTube. I've never met him in person, but I have corresponded with him. He has a community there now and make, has a YouTube channel that is really beautiful wisdoms, a bit similar to John O'Donoghue, wisdom that's quite universal. I sent him a picture of the aerial view of the, of the house and explained that you know, our plans to renovate it and to move there and how Noel had always wanted to return to Ireland and it had always been his dream to, to, to you know, have a bit of a homestead with a bit of land. And, and I said, we need to name it. If anything comes to mind, then, you know, that would be great. Don't feel pressured. But if, if when you're reading this, you think of a suitable name, then please let us know. And sure enough, a couple of days later, I got a letter from him. I just stopped the video to get my iPad so I can read you uh, from his reply. So as soon as he saw the photo, two names came to mind. So the first one he suggested is Cluan Nolig. And he even does the pronouncing for me. So he writes it in uh, Gaelic and then he um, he, he actually phonetically spells it out so I know how to say it. Clue in Nolig. That's it. Clue in Nolig, meaning Noel's Hidden Valley. And the second one was Cool Nolig, which means Noel's Secret Place. So we looked at those two and, and you know, and look, looked them up on the internet just to find out what other ver variation of meaning for those particular words were. And it seems that a Cluin is actually a, probably say like chluan, chluan is, is probably how you say it, but it, it, it's, um, it's like a, a, a clearing in the middle of a, a woodland. So that really was appropriate because of being surrounded by the, the forest and uh, a clearing and Knoll's meadow, I suppose. It's also a meadow. Literally, it's Christmas meadow, isn't it? I love the fact that he named it as Knoll's land because it acknowledges that it's something that he's always wanted and that it was destined for him, waiting for him to come. So that's really lovely. The, the other one, Kuil, uh, not sure what, I think that we looked that up and it was something like a little hidden, the emphasis was on it being a hidden hole or something like or a, a back place so Noel said I'm not having that one I'm not having my Noel's back hole so it was Clue and Nolik and that's the one that I think initially I thought was lovely that was the first one he mentioned 
So that's going to be the name of the house, Cluan Nolik. And the other day when we were just not sure at all, you might have noticed I mentioned, some of you will have picked up on it, I said in, on the video, we'll ask the house to knock the house down and rebuild or to keep the house, you know, to demolish or not to demolish. But the other thing that was a bit weird was that this vision, I thought I'd say a vision, this thought, it wasn't a thought, it was actually like a picture in my mind, in my imagination of the house. And it was this image of it with, with no gable end, both gable ends were down. There was just the front and part of the back. It was like a ruin. And there was this sense that this sort of wind was blowing through it. And that it was somehow incomplete. Almost as though the house was broken. So it was almost like the etheric um, imprint of the house would somehow not be intact, it would be torn. That's right, the word, the word came to me that there'd be like a tear in the ether of the fabric of the house. And that didn't seem like a good thing. I don't know, I can't explain it. This was all by thought, you know? And, and that made me think it was important if possible to try and keep the building intact and less absolutely necessary, you know? So I thought, well, I'll go and tell Noel what, you know, about my, uh, my little vision. I thought he might just think, well, it's just Jill being Jill and it's a little bit weird. He said, well, that's interesting because he had a dream that night. In his dream, he was underneath the house. I don't quite know what he meant by that, but he could see that there was stone there and it was solid. And he, he said he even remembered in his dream thinking that um, he could tell the engineer it, what you want about. It's actually solid down here. So it seemed like independently we were both getting this similar message that uh, there was no need to really go to extreme measures and demolish the house. If the house needed underpinning, maybe not the whole of the house would need underpinning, maybe only the part where it would be connecting. Now this is also where it gets interesting because Noel woke up that same morning with a new idea. Again. Pleasure, How much was it? 20 quid. 20 quid. I like a bargain. No, well, you don't need to be so anxious. It gets very anxious when <laughs> Noel gets out of the car. So we're picking up something else that we've seen on Facebook Marketplace. Let's see if I can see it through the back window. It's a breaker, concrete breaker. And you know, there's quite a few things that we've got because people just are happy to pass them on when they've used them and they're nearly new and we can make use of them so are you happy then i've got another tenner off all right just because you need to sort of have a bit of work you need a bit of work well it's just I've got a slight oil leak so but i think it's just an operational thing. I think it's because there's moving parts, you have to have oil, and because there's some of the moving parts are, are removable as well. They all think, you know, but it worked when you had a little go of it, yeah, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. Good. Noel's going to get his new tool out to show us. Got 
instruction manual and the box. I think, what did you say? It had only been used once. Only no, used it just to break up a bit of a patio at the back of the garage. You can see by just how sharp the tools still are. Yeah. Hardly anywhere on them. And they're normally, what, 140 quid to buy new? I mean, yeah, this, this that's heavy. If you wanted to buy a brand new one, yeah, it's like sort of something <laughs> Terminator. <laughs> So what's it called? Concrete breaker. Okay, it's just like a. I, remember the guys that, who used to stand at the side of the road, and they'd be like, "Yeah, pneumatic like drill." So you don't, and you're not on your hands and knees. Yeah. So the plan is that you're going to try and do as much of the work you can yourself, and you're going to use this to break up the concrete inside the house on the floor. Yeah. Ready for um, the foundations to be laid. We're having underfloor heating, aren't we? You're just going to go down to a certain depth. Is that what you mean? We have to go down, I think. I forget what they said now. I forget what, what they said. Yeah. I think you, you have to go at least 200 millimetres down, I think. It might even be more than that. And no, that's when you would see if um, you'd see the, the footings, because you, you'd seen something of the footings inside last time you looked, didn't you? When you... You told me that you've already seen that there are some footings on the inside of the house. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what looks like it, that was only a small area I've taken out. It yeah. Wasn't, it wasn't the, you know, I haven't taken the whole floor. I know you haven't, but what I'm saying is when you use this beast, you'd be yeah. able to, you'd get a better idea, wouldn't you, of what's there? Yeah. Well, that's the idea. Yeah. Just to use this to get it and then... A bit scary that now. I think you need a spanner or something just to turn yeah. it and it locks it in. Unless you lift that it. That's locked in. I see, yeah. So then you can just stand there, you see. Yeah. <laughs> do, go on, do do that face again. No. <laughs> Missed it. I was well, going down it's there. Too late now. I only do that one face once a year. <laughs> So you you got something else to show as well, haven't you? I did. What another new tool? This is because you had a bit of insecurity, didn't you, last time you were there? They were, they were laughing at you because of your little equipment. They were laughing at me. <laughs> they were laughing at me. So I only had a, a little cheapy uh, chainsaw. Who's they? The people that were. The people who were taking the trees out. Yeah. That had, you know, they had the proper and gear. They had their big machines and everything. Yeah. Then I turned up with my little, my little Fisher Price chainsaw, <laughs> and they were laughing at me. But never again. No, they won't be laughing now, Dad, with that beast. Yeah. yeah. I'll be the one that's laughing now. Hopefully. Yeah. But we'll see. So you're not cutting any more trees down with that. We've we've done with the tree cutting. Yeah. That's for sorting sorting out the logs. Yeah. <laughs> So that's it, just me here, Nola's set off to Ireland, in fact he's arrived there now, so next video I'll be sharing some footage. He's going to be seeing the engineer, a bit nervous about that. It's turning into a bit of a pantomime, isn't it? We're like Hansel and Gretel with our little house in the woods, lured in by all the sweeties and our romantic ideas, and he's the villain of the piece, wanting to knock it down. Now really we've got to try and keep him on side and hopefully we can, you know, come to some agreement and everybody's happy. So all your thoughts and prayers please, we need them. See you next time, take care, thanks for watching.